Welcome back to the Life at Ema podcast. We are your host, Shell. And Tiana, and tonight we talk to a very special guest, Lipedema Warrior, and a bunch of other things, Justine Martin. Justine, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, girls. It's such a pleasure. We actually met, had the pleasure of meeting you at the Lipedema Australia conference this year and learned just a little bit about you. You're many things. You're a resilience consultant, a speaker, an author, an artist. A publisher? What aren't you doing, Justine? Uh, relationships very well, but that's a different podcast. <laughs> we might have to dive into that on another episode. <laughs> because what we'd really like to tackle in this episode is your experience with Life Edema and how that led you to your most recent exciting project, the Life Edema Anthology book. But before we delve into that exciting project, can you tell us how did you come to learn of lipedema and when was that? I learned about lipedema on Instagram. Oh, isn't that where we all get diagnosed? It's 2018. I'd just been through chemo for having three primary cancers at once, as you do, and two other blood conditions. And I spent a lot of time on social media and looking at things. And this woman's profile came up and she was in this bathing suit. And I thought, oh my gosh, you're so brave your legs look like my legs and she was really being trolled and she was defending herself on socials as well that she wasn't just fat that there was something um, wrong with her in order for her legs to look like that and the link was in her bio so I went to her bio and read through it all and then Googled as you do. And I'm like, oh my God, that's me. That's my, what my mum's legs were. That's my auntie's legs. That's my cousin's legs. That's my son, not my daughter. And I went to the doctors and he turned around and told me when I went in, because I had it written on a piece of paper. And he told me there's no such word as lipedema. It's a made up American word. What you've got is actually lymphedema. And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't have fat feet. And uh, I've got the banding at the bottom of the ankles. It's not lymphedema. My feet don't swell up. Anyway, he Mm. sent me in off to a massage therapist, physiotherapist where I live. And I went into her and I said, I think I've got lymphedema. And she goes, oh, whip your pants down. And I, took my pants down she goes oh yeah you've got fat legs and I was mortified oh god my my bedside manner and I had tears welling in my eyes and she goes oh you've definitely got it and I said my doctor thinks that there's no such thing and she goes he's a bloody idiot and handed me the pamphlet to the Lipedema Association of Australia and that was a game changer because I was in my late 40s and My whole world changed right then. It validated nearly 50 years of battling with this bloody disease and having finally having some answers and knowing that it wasn't in my head and that I wasn't failing. I was a Weight Watchers leader for 10 years trying to lose the amount of weight that I was carrying and I lost 46 kilos, but you name it, I did it in order to get that 46 kilos off. And I couldn't understand how come people were coming in and they were getting 20 kilos off in 20 weeks. Yeah, it took me 445 weeks to lose 46 kilos at 0.1 a week. Wow. And that answered everything instantly. That answered everything. And I didn't think I was going out of my mind anymore. That must have been so validating. And I'm thinking about my own experience finding out on social media, like looking at somebody's legs and going, they look familiar. Like that feeling of validation to know that we don't have, like we're not alone in this and other people look like us. And then knowing what that's called. Yeah. But then I had to bring my auntie. So my mum passed away when I was 26. And I rang my auntie and I know she struggled with her legs and she's had knee problems and everything from it. And I said, I think I know why your legs are the way they are. And so she was in her early 70s 
And I said, you've got what I've got. You've got lipedema. And I said, you need to, and I pinged her all the articles and everything. And so she went off to her doctor and she was diagnosed with it. So oh, and, wow. The early 70s. So that to me is even worse than what I went through because that's another 20 years. Yeah, of course. And then now you're saying that your son may have it as well. So the fact that you're empowered with this knowledge, it sets him up on a path that you didn't get to take at his age, which is no. fabulous. And it's even harder for boys than what it is for us girls. Yeah, talk me through that. Because there's so many of so many women now that recognise what it is, mm-hmm. but the men don't. And it primarily is women, not men. It's very hard for him. He's got knee problems from it. He's done all the diet drugs. None of them work. All the classic symptoms that we have, he's Mm. experiencing as well. Wow. Um, But he doesn't have a band of women around him. He's he's got mum and he's in his early 30s. But he doesn't have what we have with all the women and the support behind it. And the men don't. And no, as we right. found out at conference, that they're not concentrating on the men. They're only concentrating at the women because they can only do one thing at a time. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Wow. So you were diagnosed in your 40s. But had you been searching for answers prior to that about your legs particularly? No. I just thought that these, my mum had the same shaped legs. My auntie had the same shaped legs. I could walk anywhere and pick someone and go, oh, she's got the same legs as me. I had a large medical team because of everything that is wrong with me and not one doctor had picked it up. Not one. And that's, I find that quite fascinating. And actually let's go to it now. So we spoke about um, being a cancer survivor can yep. you talk us through that the your cancer journey and the other comorbidities you have alongside your life edema so i've got multiple sclerosis i was diagnosed at the age of 40 with ms then in 2013 14 and 15 underwent heart surgeries for atrial fibrillation and pap Then in 2016, I was diagnosed with a condition called lavidio reticularis. So I was going purple like a zombie. My ears were black. My arms, fingers, toes were all going black. My nose, it started happening at around about 12 degrees, but then was happening at 19 degrees and below. And I live in Victoria. I try staying warm. And mm-hmm. if I didn't warm up these body, body parts, then it would cause narcosis and they could drop, they would die. Oh. So then that led me to being diagnosed with melanoma when they were looking for lymphoma and I had melanoma on my leg. Now, anaesthetic doesn't work properly on patients with lipedema. So I've since found out and I've always said to them, because when they went to cut the melanoma out, I was awake and I'm like, you're going to have to give me extra anaesthetic because it doesn't work. And they don't listen to you when that happens. So then I had the melanoma removed out of my leg and then I had decreased lung capacity, couldn't move my fingers or toes. And I was diagnosed with a condition called mixed cryoglobulinemia. So I was making too much protein in my blood, which was causing so much inflammation around all my internal organs that it was choking everything and I was dying. Then in January 2017, I was diagnosed with chronic lymphocystic leukemia and small lymphocystic lymphoma. So effectively, I had three primary cancers at once, two blood conditions and the MS. Then in 2018, I got diagnosed with the lipedema. And then last year, no, the year before, 2022, 23, around then, I was diagnosed with mast cell activation syndrome at the the beginning of last year, so 2023. No, because my lymph, my leukemia and the lymphoma, my lymphoma hadn't hit my lymph system. I was very fortunate that it had stayed contained in the bone marrow that it hadn't gone into any lymph 
because of the mixed cryoglobulin anemia being one of the earlier warning signs. So it was like this big circle. They were all feeding each other. And like my first GP that I went to when I went purple, she said, don't worry about it. Come back in four months if it's still happening. And I can tell you now I would not be here if I'd listened to her because I was stage four. And I was in for the fight of my life, literally fighting to survive. No one knows our body as much as we personally know it. And doctors are human and they make mistakes. And so I went and sought a second opinion. I see a counsellor regularly and she said, she asked if I was happy with what that doctor had said. I'm, I'm like, no, I'm not. She goes, you need to go find a second opinion. And I did. And that doctor then sent me on a trajectory of all these specialists, which still took time to get into. And that saved my life. But and I'm what a journey you've had. Active cancer patient because it keeps mm -hmm. back. It comes out of remission and then it goes back in again. And my immune system now is totally wiped out from the MS disease modifying drugs, from the vaccines that we've had and from the chemotherapy, which the one that I had was a derivative of World War I mustard gas, that I now get other people's antibodies to keep me alive. So I'm on skink therapy. I was on IVIG. So I was going to hospital every four weeks and having an infusion of other people's antibodies. But then when COVID hit, they went, no, you're going to have to learn how to do it yourself at home. So I've done over 250 infusions now and my poor legs. So they either go, it goes in my belly or my leg. My mm. legs are now lumpier than ever. They're constantly bruised. I get hives every time, every week there's more hives on my leg. But you do what you've got to do to keep going. Yeah, it sounds like you don't have it you're doing everything possible to get yourself in the best possible health which probably the benchmark for your best possible health is very different to the benchmark of the average person 100 oh, percent. but you know from having mast cell activation syndrome and um having you know the histamine intolerance um i'm very limited to the amount of different foods that i can eat as well and people often say to me, oh, you don't look your age. What's your secret? And you must have good genetics. And I just laugh at them and go, you've got to be kidding me. But I only drink water or a bit of herbal tea. I don't have any gluten. I don't have any dairy. I haven't had caffeine in 32 years. So there has been a benefit to all of it is that my skin is great and I've hardly got a grey hair on my head because I'm not having all the, the preservatives and the high inflammation foods um, as well. But I, I joke around with people that I'm full of formaldehyde <laughs> with the amount of crap that they've given me over the years to keep me alive. There's going to be some formaldehyde in there and I'm pickling from the inside out. <laughs> So funny. And I love that glass half full type attitude with the fact that you're so limited in your diet and everything is doing your skin a really good justice. And like, you got to take the wins where you can, right? And the glass half full is always the glass is refillable. Well, that's beautiful. Love it's that. never half empty or half full. It can always be refillable. Refillable. That's beautiful, Justine. What a great message. I'm going to bring you back to your lipoedema now. When yes. do you believe that it started to develop? I reckon it started to develop when I was um, a toddler. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. I look back on my toddler photos and my legs were not like other toddlers' legs. I had the double knee and everything happening when I was like two years old. Then it evened out a little bit and then it came back as a teenager, mm -hmm. yeah, early teen. And I'm very tall as well. And yeah, my mum was five foot one and I'm five foot 11. That hormone spurting growth, the stress that I was under looking after my mum. So my mum had MS as well as her having lipoedema. And I had a very stressful childhood, teenage years and, I, and it really started then. And then I was, because I was so morbidly obese, which 
I had lipedema fat, but I also had normal fat because mm-hmm. I ate badly and mm. I ate badly for a long period of time and I peaked at a size 26 and that was when I was 20, when I was 26 after mum died and I ate out of grief and trying to cushion from the outside world as well. And then I took control and decided that the only thing that I can now control in my life, there's two things, on how I look and the nutrition that I put inside me. Yeah. And that old saying that we are what we eat is so true because our cells in our body are rejuvenated by the nutrition that we're putting in. So if you're putting high sugar nutrition into your system, which is a high inflammation food and lipedema and in particularly MS is inflammation around the nerves, then you're feeding that inflammation Mm. and you're feeding that sugar's not part of my vocabulary. And if I have sugar, I'm like heading for the water because I think it's so salty now, even though it's sugar and I don't get the mood swings that I used to get. I'm not getting the highs and lows. I have so much energy, even though I have got MS. And I commented to my doctor at the beginning of the year that I'm the healthiest I've ever been. And that shocks people when they say, when they're like, what? And I'm like, I look after myself better now Mm -hmm. than what I ever have in my whole entire life. Yeah, because you're doing all of these preventative things because you have the longest list of things going on that if you don't, put your health and your nutrition at the front, like first and foremost, then that's going to bite you in the butt big time. Yeah, that's right. I woke up in the end of 2017 and I couldn't walk. And I spent three weeks in hospital learning how to walk again. And that was a big wake up call as well. And I was watching my diet and stuff like that, but I was still having sugar and a lot of alcohol and all those hidden things. I'm like, I can't keep doing this. I want to live a long, healthy, happy life. And so my, like you said, my normal health is different to someone else's, but I make the best of it. I live with chronic pain in my legs and I don't know if that's lipedema pain or if that's MS pain. No one can tell me the difference because they're very similar. At the moment, I've got a big patch on the front of my shin that's just burning. And my feet shoot out electricity. So some days I can wear high heels. Other days it's no way. Some days I can wear tight jeans. The other days, no, I I can only wear wide leg pants. Then some days those wide leg pants I can't wear when they brush past my legs. Okay, I'm in a tighter pant today. So some days I'm carrying more fluid in my legs than what I am on other days. So I've learned to adapt and modify. There's no point now getting upset. Some days I can't get those skinny jeans on, but then other days they just slide straight on. It is what it is. You can sit in the corner and get angry and get on a pity party, but man, that takes too much energy to do that. Or you can take your energy and you can put it into something good and you can leave a legacy that you're proud of. And that's the way that I'm going about it. Uh, That is the perfect attitude. And I love that because it is a roller coaster ride. And when this all first started for me, I was like, oh, so what did I do? What I kept trying to find, oh, why, why am I heavier today? Like, why are my clothes uncomfortable today? Why do my legs hurt today? And then I'm like, let's just back up a little bit. Just accept it. Be more flexible. Like you said, some days you won't be able to wear your skinny jeans and some days even the wide leg pants annoy your shins because your shins are tender. Um, And that took me a long time to not be constantly trying to find a reason. Like, why? Just deal with it, Shell. Just put one step in front of the other, move on. So you you did. Sorry, I was relieved when I did find out about it that it made sense why I can't kneel down on my legs. Mm Because the razor blades that are slicing through my leg, that's probably the hardest is kneeling down on, on my shins. And the rate yep. like slicing through and then having, I don't know if you girls experience this, but when I have a shower, it's like someone is running razor blades straight down my legs and my legs are being sliced open just by the water running down. 
Oh, oh sounds horrendous. Well, I don't know if that's an MS thing or if it's a life or Jima thing. No, that's oh, certainly yeah. not my experience, Justine. That sounds horrendous. Oh, that's an MS yeah. thing. Then. Yeah, it might be an MS thing because, yeah, I haven't felt that. And I love a shower, so that would really <laughs> upset me. <laughs> and so you have alluded to how lipedema affects your life when it comes to clothes and things like that. How else has it affected, like, the way you do your work or any activities that you enjoy doing? Oh, where do I go from here? How do I say this? Okay, so I became a life drawing model back in oh, 2013. At the same time, I started visiting nudist features. And I did that to gain control and to of my body. And I feel so much more relaxed on a nudist beach and comfortable than on a clothing beach. There you go. Because we're all equal on yeah. uh, a nudist beach. Yeah, it's so true. You're yeah. all vulnerable. We all get the, the skinny mum is sitting or the skinny woman is sitting there judging me by being on a nudist beach. And we're all just celebrating each other being there and just being That's yourself. Exactly. Freedom. I've always wanted to do the Sydney skinny. Yeah. You heard of the Sydney skinny? Yes. I'm like, one day I'll do that. Do it. Just do it. <laughs> it's so liberating. And then my family all laugh when I do go to a clothing beach because I had to go and buy swimmers because I didn't have any. <laughs> um, and then to be a life drawing model, that in itself was a just a beautiful experience to do. And I did it for quite a few years. My PR girl won't let me do that anymore because she goes, that's a publicity nightmare waiting to happen. But She's no fun. No, I've got some amazing drawings of me naked at home where we are so critical, especially us lipo girls, on the dents and the bumps in our bodies and especially when we're photographed. But when you get someone draw you and the silhouette on that line it is just amazing. And they used to love drawing me because they love drawing curvier girls because it's very mm. hard to draw a skinny model. They like the curvature. And that really boosted my 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 self-esteem is the word that I'm looking for. But I used to own a clothing store. So uh, I couldn't even get clothes to fit me in the clothing mm -hmm. back in the day. And relationships have always been harder as well with getting naked in front of a, a, a man intimate and, a, oh, please don't look at my legs. Don't look at my legs. And all you the might need to invite him to the nudist beach, Justine. Combine oh, yeah. the two. Yeah, that's right. And someone once said to me, for a man, don't point out your faults because they won't have seen them. I have no idea. I'm no, excited I'm to have a woman naked in front of them. That's exactly right. So don't point out those faults when you meet someone new because they're not looking at that until you point it out to them. Yep. 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 So let's talk about your Lipedema Anthology book. What's this all about? It sounds very exciting. I put together an anthology for MS. Last year we did that and we sat at number one on Amazon for a good couple of months and we're still hovering. We're in the top 20 still and sometimes we creep back into the top 10 for in neurological disorders. And that got me thinking because I wanted to raise awareness on, on multiple sclerosis. I was an MS ambassador for nearly 10 years. And most people know of MS, but don't know what MS actually does. And we put this project together and we raised awareness and there's a lot of neurologists that are actually using it in their toolkit for newly diagnosed people. And so that book is good for any, anyone that wants to know about MS, whether you're a carer, whether you've got MS, whether you've had it for 20 years, whether you're just diagnosed for nurses, for doctors. It's 26 raw accounts of what it's like to live with this incurable disease. So then I thought, wouldn't it be good to do the same thing, but on a larger scale with lipedema? My team and I sat down and at first we were going to do it for 26 people, 25, 26 people, and it was going to cost a lot more for each person to get into to cover the costs of the marketing and everything. 
And then I sat down, I thought, no, let's change it. Let's get a hundred different voices to write 1,000 words each and charge them $150, which will just cover the cost of the book and a little bit of marketing from it. And the profit from the sale of the books, I will produce more books that we can send to doctors or people can contact me and I'll send them out a book. So we'll sell them, but then we can give some out as well. That's what we want to do. Oh. And how do we, Lipedema doesn't, Australia don't have a very big budget. No one's got a big budget to spread the word on this. You guys are doing an amazing job with your podcast. But how do we get this in front of medical practitioners who still don't agree that it's there, that it's such a thing? So wouldn't it be good that this book in the future becomes a history book? where it's cured and it's the same thing with the ms book is wouldn't it be good if this was a a history book in a hundred years time this goes down in history of this is what it was like to live with this or 50 years time or whenever it is imagine a society where there there isn't 11 percent of women that are walking around with this that have those nice legs but it needs to be told of what it's like to live with this. And not everyone can have surgery. People who can't have surgery can write in there. People that have gone and have sur- had surgery in there. So it becomes a handbook for people that are newly diagnosed or they're walking through a bookstore or they're looking on Amazon or their friend says, hey, have you seen this book? Because we don't have anything available to us like that around the mm. world. And I find that appalling. So as a publisher, I want to do my bit in order to help. And that's where the Lipedema Book Project came in. And we've had a few obstacles, but that doesn't stop us from it. It's obstacles just. I'm known as the queen of resilience. And Mm. I've got a new motto now that I never bounce backwards. I don't bounce back with resilience. I always bounce forward. And Mm. out of every adversity, something better has come from it. And this book is one of those. So, you know, if we can get a hundred people in there, there's no launch date yet because I know you're going to ask me about one. When we get hundred, when we get that hundred together, and we've got about thirty at the moment, then I'll publish it. And mm-hmm. as each chapter comes in, we're editing as we go. So it's not a case of you know, a hundred are in now, we've got to edit a hundred thousand words. No, as each chapter is written and comes in, we edit it and it goes in the file waiting to get our hundred. I wanted a decent thick book. I wanted a thin little one. It's going to be a decent thick one to get the broad stories of everyone. So it's not full of people that have had surgeries or it's not full of people that haven't had surgeries, that there's a broad demographic across there and ages as well girls teenage girls are being diagnosed with this and then like my auntie who's in her 70s that have been diagnosed with it so again that broad thing my cousin she's only just been diagnosed in the last six months and I'd lost contact with her and I saw a picture of her on Facebook and she's really been struggling with her weight and I just inboxed her and said hey I think you've got this I think you've got lipedema and lymphedema. You need to go to your doctor and find out. And she's in Sydney and what do you know, she's got both. And she's actually stage three, stage four with hers as well. And she's also got vision. She's legally blind as well. So it's just horrific. If we can get this book together and we can raise awareness, we can send it to the frigging politicians and say, read this. We can send it to the health minister and say, read this. We can send it to the state health ministers, read this. This is what 11% of all women and the percentage of men are living with. How much is it costing the Australian government in loss of wages and Medicare and everything because of this? Yeah. So that's me on my best, Megan. Yeah, that's all right. We'll have listeners who want to get involved. Where do we send them? To morpheuspublishing.com.au. Okay, let me type that. 
And Morpheus, you're still after another 70 entries. Entries. Yeah. Very cool. If we could get 70 entries in the next couple of months, we'll have it out by Christmas. Otherwise, yeah, very cool. really next year. And I'd really love to have it out before the Lipedema conference. Yes. Yeah, so we've got all, what's that? August. Yeah. August so next year. Months, 12 months. We could definitely have one done by then and if not be starting on a second volume as well from it. So, you know, if anyone is interested, if you want to tell your story but you just want your first name mentioned, you don't have to go in with your actual name. We'll put you in as a pseudo name in there yeah. if you want to be protected. Yeah. You don't have to have your photo put in with your chapter either. There's so many different variants that we can do. We just need those stories to go in of what it, on true accounts of what it's like to live with this. You know, mentioning in there as well, if you do have any other issues that are tied in with it, like me with the mast cell activation syndrome, who knew that my heart surgery was all connected to it? Who knew that anaesthetic didn't work properly on lipedema patients? What you will learn from this book will be massive. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's also so voices. therapeutic to have an avenue to tell our stories. But first, when I was diagnosed, it was my Instagram page that I set up and it was just a personal diary of my experience because that's how I could express it. And now it's evolved, thanks to Shell, to sharing bits at a time every episode of my journey through conversations with people like yourself on our episodes and this is just another medium that people can take to share them their journey and receive a little bit of healing in the process that they're getting it out I mean there's something so powerful about getting pen to paper and putting your story down on paper and so this is just a way for it to be remembered. A hundred percent it leaves a legacy. I'm an international keynote speaker and I now stand on stage and pull my skirt up and I educate on why my legs are the way that they are. And, and there'll always be women that come up afterwards and say, do you think that I've got it? And I'm like, I'm no medical expert, but let me look at your knees. <laughs> you can pick and them. The knees are the sign. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, you need to go to your doctor and ask your doctor. And I never say yes or no. I just look at them and I'm like, you need to go to your doctor. And if I can raise awareness, traveling the world and sharing my journey and how I stumbled across it and everything else that's gone wrong as well, then it gives me some purpose as to why my legs are the way they are and my bum's the way that it is and the pain as well that I experience on a daily basis with it. Yeah, I love that. And as you're saying, we all found out about this on social media. And if that representation wasn't there, if that, those people hadn't started advocating and bringing awareness, we wouldn't be where we are now. So having a book with all of those stories, like a hundred stories, there's going to be at least one that you will resonate with. Oh. There's going to be at least one voice that is, that's me. And that's, yeah, that's awesome. And I love that. And that there may be some that actually a thousand words is not much to write. You, you're not going to get much in a thousand words. And there may be some from there that decide that they actually want to continue and write their, their whole story down about mm -hmm. it. And I can help that as well. I can take them and take them through the whole writing process on, on writing a whole book. But just for them to share that thousand words and I can help them write that thousand words as well. I've, I've got a um, client, an author at the moment, that she can't move from the neck down. And she's got MS, she's primary progressive, and her book comes out next month, a little mm. book with art. And she's pretty much written the whole thing by voice text and support workers for it. There's ways and means around everything. And we work with a lot of people with disabilities, with Morpheus Publishing and our inner circle writing group that people who are dyslexic and people that can't even read properly uh, there's no excuse we can definitely help you I can interview people and get the transcripts back and then edit it and there's their thousand words 
So Ooh, if they that. don't know where to start, oh, I can help them on where to start. If they're sitting there listening, going, oh, yeah, I'd really like to be a part of that project, but I don't know how to start, just look up Morpheus Publishing, contact me, and I'll definitely help you start. Oh, that is awesome, Justine, because we all have a story to tell, but we can't all tell it in the same way. So <laughs> I love that. And as Tiana was saying, there's, it's so therapeutic being able to tell your story to someone. Yeah. And Wouldn't for a beautiful cause. That, that this book was available in every major library. Would be. Yeah. 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 That would just be amazing if we could do that. When you publish a book, it has to go to the National Library and the State Library. That's part of the Copyright Act. And so there's a start. There would be. It's and we, true. What we generally do as well with our anthologies is whatever state the authors are from, we actually send them to those state libraries as well, which we don't have to, mm -hmm. but we do. So there's a start there. And then when I'm traveling, I normally take a couple of books and go on. Like I've got sitting in the National Library of Ireland. <laughs> Good on you. Over there, and I had some spare books, and rather than throw them out because I was over luggage to get home, I'm like, I'm going to the library and donating all these. When I travel, I, I donate books and get them around everywhere. But I'm just surprised that no one has done a project like this before. And it's, I want to give back. I want to give back to the community, and I don't want, I don't want particularly teenage girls to go through what. I went through it as a teenager. My nickname was Tank in high school. And yeah. things like that stay with you. I was known as garbage disposal by my family because I ate more and I was bigger and things like that stay with you forever. So if we can help normalise that we're not just that, and Absolutely. not to be ashamed mm -hmm. at all. That shame that comes with these legs should not be there. Yeah, absolutely. And you just made a beautiful segue because we're up to our last question, Justine. If you could go back and give your younger self a pep talk, what would you tell her? Be kind to yourself. Yeah. Just be kind. Yeah, because we are so harsh. We criticise our body on a day, daily manner. Our legs, we criticise. We criticise every time we look at ourselves in clothes in a mirror or going and trying new clothes on. Yeah, be kind to yourself. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Justine, for being brave and sharing your story and also giving us your time this evening to chat with us. Thanks for having me on, girls. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yay. All the very best with the Lacodema Anthology book. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Without the Lacodema podcast, we relied on word of mouth and existing connections. Our following has happened organically, and we are so honoured by your support. As we learn more about the world of social media and algorithms, we have a request. When you are listening to our podcast or watching on YouTube, let us know what you think. Hit follow or subscribe. Leave us a comment or write a review. The more engagement we get, the more our message is shared. And the greater our reach to those women suffering in silence. You are listening to the Life at Ema podcast. Please take away from this podcast what resonates with you and please see your GP or preferred specialist for diagnosis and healthcare. We are Shelley and Tiana from the Lipedema podcast. Until our next episode, bye for now.